Films, literature, and cinema. He has published so many things that it's uh, extremely difficult for me to uh, list them all. Let me mention simply um, his most uh, recent publications, and uh, some uh, very often uh, derived from um, conferences he has um, organized. Um, on Tim Burton, the cinema of transformations on uh, Lovecraft, um, Lovecraft au prisme de l'image, Spectre de Peau, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, I mean, um, Le Goût du Noir, and uh, most uh, recently, perhaps, uh, Dark Recesses in the House of Hammer, published by Peter Lang in uh, March 222. Uh, so he will now talk about Jekyll and Hyde on screen, Dreadful Pleasures, which sounds, of course, very nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for this generous introduction, and thanks to the organizers of this conference. Um, so, uh, in fact, it's called Experiment in Pleasure now, because I'm not going to talk about uh, the body snatcher. Um, Stevenson's novella raises the question of man's identity, introducing, like Frankenstein, scientific discourse in various ways. Jekyll does not use parts of dead bodies to create life, uh, subverting natural biological processes. He transgresses another frontier, inner to the self, so as to dissociate body and soul. Separating the two sides aims at freeing the self from all evil impulses. The soul must be purified purified, rid of the demands of the body associated with desire, the pleasures of the flesh, a source of moral corruption. Jekyll fails or rather obtains a radically inverted result. His experiment, far from neutralizing evil, leads to the advent of a new combination, body and spirit, deprived of soul if not intellect. Hyde, a dark double of Jekyll, is free from moral constraints, only striving at indulging his pleasures. The word pleasure is used first in relation to Utterson, who enjoys his wine, albeit with a sense of guilt, but also Jekyll. In his last statement, he refers to his impatient gaiety of disposition. Belinda has already stated that, so I will skip uh, most of the quotations. But uh, Jekyll adding, I concealed my pleasure, revealing a form of hypocrisy. Pleasure is used ambivalently in those two sentences, the second referring to the separate identities. Jekyll anticipates the just and the unjust. I had learned to dwell with pleasure is associated with illicit, uh, amoral behavior, while the following sentence associates pleasure with good deeds, quite the opposite, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace. Hyde expresses recurrently the pleasures he feels in his new being, um, with references to pleasure, so I, I skip that, but incredibly sweet sensual images delighted me like wine, exulting in the freshness of the sensation, etc or drinking pleasure with bestial avidity from any degree of torture. And of course, bestial and torture is quite important. And uh, concerning the murder of Carew, transport of glee, taking delight in every blow. And if I insist on that, it's because we find these images in the film. Um, whereas there are no, uh, almost no female characters in the book, minor ones such as the little girl high tramples upon, servants or the woman selling matches, the play and the films insist on the relationship of Jekyll Hyde with women, emphasizing the sexual element, which was toned down to minimum by Stevenson, hints to Jekyll's irregularities, I quote. Adding female characters in Hollywood adaptations emphasizes pleasure, either associated with romantic love, sexual desire, or more dreadful ones, indeed, verging on ultraviolence and sadistic behavior. So I focus on three classic adaptations among the more than 100 adaptations of Chicken and Hyde. Um, Robertson, John Robertson's silent film, 1920, uh, Ruben Mamoulian's uh, Paramount, 1932, and Victor Fleming, MGM remake in 1941. Um, 
and indeed we could say that the films fill the gaps of uh, the, the text uh, and of course which leaves less space for imagination as we uh, already highlighted yesterday. So first uh, so a, few, a few remarks. Hollywood has from the outset deeply altered the structure and contents of the original story, but transformation first came from the stage. The play written and directed by Russell Sullivan was performed in 1887 in Boston, then New York, and in London, where it opened in 1888, while the Whitechapel murders were starting to traumatize public opinion and puzzle the police. This accounts for the subsequent conjunction on screen of Jack the Ripper and Jekyll and Hyde, of which we find traces in Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, 1967, or Ma and Mary Riley. I won't have time to talk about these films, of course. Sullivan and Mansfield brought uh, alterations which set a model for subsequent screen adaptations. The play gets rid of the embedded narratives and resets chronological order. However, it preserves suspense by delaying the explanation of Jekyll's situation. Another change is the foregrounding of the Jekyll Hyde persona at the expense of the characters of Utterson, Enfield, and Lanyon, who only keep a minor part. At the opposite, the episodic character of Carew, the acknowledged murder of Hyde in the novel, becomes more prominent as General Sir Danvers Carew, to whose uh, daughter, Agnes, Jekyll is engaged. So the idea of engagement, of course, is also something that is not present in the text, as Linda reminded. Uh, the adaptation follows the same narrative line, emphasizing emblematic settings. Stress is laid on the contrast between the bourgeois world and its values, exemplified in the drawing room scenes, the world of poverty and suffering to which Jekyll devotes his time, and the world of lowly pleasures tainted with moral corruption uh, where Hyde revels. Duality is twofold, Jekyll and Hyde, but also the duo of women, the angelic and respectable fiancé, as opposed to the low-class, sexually promiscuous woman. Contrary to the novel where Jekyll is middle-aged, uh, the films feature him as young and attractive, uh, beloved by women. Uh, he's also presented as an idealistic, philanthropic, non-conformist character who chooses to devote his life to curing the ailments of the poor rather than attending the whims of the ruling class. Hence the recurrent motif of Jekyll sorry, being delayed at dinner parties, opera, or other official invitations in a way discarding bourgeois pleasures. Um, Robertson sets his opening scene in Jekyll's Laboratory where he takes pleasure in transgressive scientific research. I'm going to take time to show the clip. But he also adds a sequence in an opium den which enables to draw a parallel with a picture of Dorian Gray already introduced at the outset of the film by the personality of Sir George Carew who appears as a corrupting figure inciting Jekyll to yield to his desires thus playing a part analogous to that of Lord Henry Wotton uh, in Wilde's novel. Stress is laid on Jekyll's innocence and purity. The idea experimenting upon himself to carry out the separation of his good and evil self is first suggested by Carew, who brings him to the musical, the place where various sources of pleasure may be found. So, uh, I go on uh, without sound. Anyway, there's only music, it's a silent film. But you see what I'm talking about. Um, Jekyll's embarrassment and reticence when confronted with Gina Nitanaldi, the dancer, leads to, it leads to his flight. Uh, oh, no, no, not sound, no, no sound, no, please. Not, not at all. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, if not, <laughs> okay. Uh, it leads to his flight, a repression of his carnal desires. However, he is gradually contaminated by the Hyde persona as is shown in the scene where he gets angry against Sir George and changes into Hyde as a consequence of that. The transformation Jekyll Hyde is achieved through simple means at first in the full view of the camera. I won't sh show you that clip. John Barrymore uses mm, facial mimics, expressive leers, suggesting pleasure indeed, filming close up and contortions together with the change in posture. His back is bent, he walks slowly with a limp and, and head shrunk between his shoulders. The cut allowing to ha add prosthetics, of course. Um, and uh, is associated both with a nape, his lips pushed forward, placing his hand upon his mouth. And Barrymore is inspired by the hunchback Richard III, which he impersonated on stage at the time. Hyde indulges into various forms of illicit pleasures, including sex and drugs. A scene implies a sadistic streak when Hyde, 
confronts the degraded Gina and another younger and fresher prostitute to their images in the mirror, revealing in a way to the young one what lies in store for her. Actual violence erupts later when Hyde joyfully tramples upon a little boy, not a girl, uh, in the street, obviously relishing the situation, or when Jekyll changes into Hyde and beats Carew to death after Jekyll, after Jekyll has reproached him with tempting and corrupting him. I'll come back to what, Gina said, uh, to what sorry, uh, Linda said concerning uh, the confusion of Jekyll and Hyde, which is explicitly uh, formulated in the films. I am Jekyll, says Hyde. Uh, women were, uh, so this brutal murder unleashes Hyde's evil instincts, leading to the attempted rate of Millicent to the fiancé, ultimately spared by Hyde's death. For the spectator, Hyde remains external, the pure spectacle of abjection and horror, whereas in the Mamoulian version, of course, we have a subjective approach of Jekyll, especially in the opening sequence, which is quite well known. Women were present in the previous silent adaptations, so I, I just mentioned that, but I won't insist. Uh, but we find here for the first time in that film a foregrounding of two antinomic figures, uh, Millicent, the pure girl, and Gina, the uh, Italian dancer. The latter may have been inspired by Sybil Vane, who falls in love with Dorian and commits suicide, as you remember. This exotic, attractive, dark-haired uh, dancer that you just see now announces Mamoulian's Ivy Pearson, but she remains a secondary character. Her encounter with Jekyll is cut short and her relationship with Hyde is hardly developed. Stress is laid on, another, on an almost documentary approach of slum life, as you could see, in relation with the American context and social preoccupations of the 20s. Some scenes evoke vividly lowly pleasures, alcoholism, an echo of campaigns in favor of prohibition, drugs and prostitution. This is a pre-code film prior to the Hays Code, implemented in 1927 first. Beyond the references to a Wildian Inferno, the film means to tell some, something about the hidden aspects of American life represented at the same period in the social melodramas of D.W. Griffith. The film emphasizes also the predicament of the poor, denouncing the indifference of the ruthlessness of, uh, of, sorry, uh, of the high society, only preoccupied with mundane gossips and whose main activity concerns attending dinner parties and enjoying illicit pleasures, as you just saw. The title card introducing George Carew reading the Chronicle is revealing, I quote, as far from suffering and misery as he could stand, illustrated by drawing representing as is hedonism, a flagon of wine, some grapes and a fowl. The last asset of the film is the outstanding performance of John Barrymore, but I skipped that. Uh, I will then show uh, another extract again without sound. This is Jekyll uh, addressing, just before he has addressed as Jekyll, now he's transformed into Hyde. Um, so comparative analysis now, because the, in fact, as I said, the MGM uh, is a remake of the 1931 film. One before the code is reinforced and the one after the code is reinforced, which accounts for many differences. If we may consider Memorian 19. Uh, film is a readaptation of Robertson's silent version with technological improvements and sophisticated social uh, special effects. The MGM version must be seen as a remake according to some defining criteria of the concept, which you all know, so I won't insist on that. But basically, Thomas Leach identifies four different types the readaptation and the update involving different attitudes toward the literary hypertext, the homage or true remake concerning the attitude of the original film the homage pays tribute to a classic work and renounces any claim to be better, while the true remake combines a focus on the cinematic original with an uh, accommodating stance which seeks to make the original relevant by updating it. And this is exactly what happens in the MGM remake. Um, the MGM film follows the same narrative pattern and foregrounds almost the same sequences in the same order, often keeping the same details and objects. Jo for instance, Hyde enjoying the rain, Hyde's garter, uh, we'll come back to that, the dance scene between Jekyll and Muriel, Beatrix, the use of mirrors. In both films, a spatial and symbolic opposition is built between the cabaret, the variety, variety musical, or the palace of frivolities, uh, where Ivy sings, a locus of lowly pleasures and corruption, 
and the garden where Jekyll courts his fiancée, an idyllic place associated with nature, a nest for romantic love with two cherubs and water lilies in the Mamoulian film. Another important place is Hyde's apartment in Soho, which can be contrasted with Jekyll's patrician house. Yet the Soho apartment is also decorated with taste and adorned with many paintings and sculptures in Mamoulian film in particular, thus suggesting Hyde is not only a primitive beast, obviously, and testifying to refinement and artistic taste. This conjunction of physical bestiality, sadism, and sophistication makes Hyde all the more uncanny and blurs the two univocal meaning, both things foregrounding Stevenson's dichotomous space within Jekyll's own house, the bourgeois refined apartments where Jekyll plays, enjoys playing the organ uh, in Mamoulian film, receives his guests and patients and admires himself in the mirror, uh, and a secret laboratory accessible through a small gangway where the doctor carries out his secret experiments. Both films use the same dramatic tensions and conflicts between the father and Jekyll, Lanyon, the conformist doctor, and Jekyll, the more daring and transgressive scientist. And they dramatize the contrast between the two female characters, then the bourgeois fiancé, <laughs> with only a change of name in the second film, Beatrix, obviously a reference to Dante, and uh, instead of Muriel, and the low-class Ivy, uh, Miriam Hopkins, and Ingrid Bergman in the second film. Of course, the, I won't insist on that, but there's a lot of play on, the, on big stars. Okay. Uh, uh, there are, however, some shifts. In Mamoulian's film, Jekyll is driven to drink his potion because of his scientific hubris, but also because of his delayed wedding inducing sexual frustration. In Fleming's version, Jekyll first struggled to save Sam Higgins, a patient obsessed with evil as a constant gas, a gas explosion, and experiments on animals, but it, there's not so much insistence on sexual frustration. But William Jekyll is less repressed than Robertson's, and he appears early in the film as drawn to the seductions of the flesh as embodied by Ivy Pearson, Miriam Hopkins, was famous with uh, a role in Sanctuary, which was censor heavily censored. He does not express any guilt feeling or even regret after having kissed her, which leads to a shocked comment from his friend Lanyon. Spencer Tracy's interpretation uh, is highly derivative of the earlier version, as he also expresses no pangs of conscience after the scene of seduction with the barmaid Ivy, Ingrid Bergman. Uh, both characters acknowledge the human propensity to yield to sexual desire as something natural. Uh, I would, again, uh, as I said, both things rely on the star system, but I skipped that. Uh, there are some gender issues, obviously. Uh, romance also versus the erotic pleasure. Mamoulian gives an equally important part to Muriel, the upper-class respectable fiancé, and Ivy, the low-class promiscuous fallen woman, also suggesting an implicit rivalry. Uh, Muriel is even presented by Jekyll during the garden scene as an initiatory figure, as an embodiment of the mystery of female sex and desire. Um, if I can show you that. Hmm. Okay, garden scene again. Without sound, sorry. <laughs> uh, at least you have the image. Uh, as Jekyll states emphatically, uh, so I, I quote what you want to see, but you can have the subtitles in French. But now the unknown where your wears your face look back, looks back at me with your eyes. The impact of Jekyll's world is reinforced by framing and editing devices. A close-up on Muriel's face followed by an extreme close-up on her eyes, suggesting the fascination she exerts upon Jekyll, whose eyes are also framed in close-up, as if the, he were drawing him, uh, she were drawing him, as well as the spectator, of course, because the pleasure is also for the spectator, to her like a magnet. The female character is sublimated and seen as unfathomable in a poesque tradition, the eyes of Lygia, as, well, as, as deep sorry, as the well of Democritus, as you remember. As the kiss Luigi Arditi's waltz song Il Bacio is resumed, and the camera glides first on the statue of a cherub, then upon twin water lilies until it discloses the apparently ominous shadow projected on the pavement of a man which proves only to be the butler, interrupting a pleasurable scene. And this happens also in the remake. Uh, however, as soon as they get inside, the lover starts waltzing again, lost among the other dancing couples. 
Jekyll's request to marry earlier is rejected by the general, who judges his endeavor positively indecent. That's in the first film, in Mamoulian. Jekyll, frustrated and furious, takes his leave. But we may notice that Muriel's image uh, lingers superimposed on the next shot, where we see Jekyll and Lanyon step down the staircase. This lab dissolve announces a sub subsequent, more insistent and significant one, that on Ivy's dangling legs, while it establishes the first of a series of parallels between the two women. Various devices are used, such as lateral wipes, which splits the screen, when Ivy Pearson on the left-hand side of the frame drinks a glass of champagne after a visit to Jekyll, while Muriel on the right side vainly expects a doctor at the reception where their wedding should be announced. This device stresses the dramatic irony of the situation. Jekyll uh, neglects his fiancée because in the physical form of Hyde he is about to visit Ivy, who he calls my pretty little bride, but he's only intent on murdering her for her betrayal. In Fleming's version, the vision of women is more conventional. Beatrix, the fiancée, is presented as naive and submissive, knowledge and power being on the side of the male figure, as can be seen in the equivalent garden scene, which I don't have time to show you. Jekyll dispenses this knowledge to the innocent girl, who also heard Jekyll talk of the presence of good and evil in each individual, a very Manichaean, to her anxious query concerning the nature of their love feelings. I quote, there is nothing in evil that uh, is that in there, is there, sorry. Jekyll answers in a very self-assured paternalistic tone, like a father figure almost. Uh, of course, no, there is, uh, there is no problem. The end uh, is similar to Mamoulian's, but with a difference. It is no longer a servant whose shadow is ominously projected on the ground, but the father himself who interrupts the lover's embrace, preceding the, the noise of his footsteps on the soundtrack. During the whole scene, Fleming uses a classical, sober editing style, contrasting with Mamoulian, who constantly changes the frame, makes a provocative use of close-ups, and uses quick editing, denying the famous Hollywood tra classic transparency. After this romantic and lyrical version, both Mamoulian and Fleming provide a more sensual, eroticized version in introducing the character of Ivy, the loose-mannered girl, uh, so played by Miriam Hopkins and Ygritte Bergman, but in a different, a different register. The sequence where they strive at seducing a rather willing Chico is a good illustration of the spectator's involvement through mise-en-scene. While the camera is set inside Ivy's room, uh, I don't know if I have time to show you that, uh, okay, without sound again, sorry, but at least you will um, Yes, uh, giving way to Jekyll, holding his arm, Ivy, who showers insults on her aggressor, then starts a game of seduction that you can see here. The next shot is an extreme close-up on the top of Ivy's thighs, corresponding to the point of view of Jekyll, but also positing the spectator as voyeur uh, and almost participant, seeing Jekyll remains off screen, only his hand entering the frame as it is seized by Ivy, who presses it to her thigh. The involvement becomes even stronger when the position of the camera changes, Ivy looking at the camera, breaking the fourth wall, facing Jekyll off screen, thus the spectator. Uh, however, while Jekyll is supposed not to see having his back turned, the spectator is having a privileged position as he's allowed to witness Ivy's undressing. The camera follows Ivy's movement while she bends to pull up her dress, but instead of coming up to focus on her face, it remains fixed upon her thighs, and it raised again only when Ivy, having taken off her stocking, throws her first garter at Jekyll's feet, uh, as you can see here. Uh, by showing only Jekyll's leg and cane in the frame, Mamoulian favors the spectator's identification as he is inclined to fill the missing part of Jekyll's body. The scene culminates with a glimpse of Ivy's naked body as she embraces Jekyll, while Lanyon was entered unexpectedly and interrupted the kiss again. So. Uh, parallel with the garden scene. The image of the dangling legs of Ivy continues to be seen through a very slow lab dissolve lasting 35, 25 seconds on the following shots, while her words are rep repeated almost obsessively, come back, come back soon. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, this is contrasted, it's not Obama, but uh, uh, this is contrasted with a lingering image of Muriel, which only remains a few seconds after Jekyll has left the house with Lanyon. And clearly, uh, she has more appeal, I mean, Ivy has more appeal than Muriel. 
while this scene stimulates Jekyll's erotic impulses and leads him to become more pressing when he next meets Muriel, it will also motivate his transformation as Hyde while he loses patience about Muriel's delayed return from a trip imposed by her father. The treatment by Fleming of the same scene is less overtly eroticized. Ingrid Bergman remains almost fully clothed, disclosing little of her body except for her bare shoulders, and the, seal, the scene sorry, is more romanticized, even melodramatic, less playful and ironic. The director relies on the proximity of the two characters, filmed in close-up, but there is no metaphorical play, no sexual games with the garter, for instance, obviously, as a kind of metonymic uh, representation of Ivy's body, and little exhibition of flesh. Because of the strict implementing of the PCA, the Hays Code, reinforced in 1934, Fleming's approach is less audacious and is in its conception of Hyde and his representation of women who are more dependent and submissive. Both versions play upon the ambiguity of the Jekyll Hyde character, especially in the parallel scenes of Ivy's visit to Jekyll's cabinet after she has been beaten up by Hyde, and of the last and tragic confrontation between Hyde and Ivy. It is made clear for the spectator that Jekyll is conscious of what Hyde does and vice versa. This is why Jekyll has some money brought to Ivy, why, but also why he feels embarrassed when Ivy shows her bruised body and complains about Hyde's brutality. This mutual awareness is also shown through Hyde's sarcastic repetition of Jekyll's words and Ivy's statements. Obviously, Jekyll and Hyde share a common memory. In Mamoulian's film, before strangling Ivy, Hyde even gives away his secret, asserting his hatred of Jekyll, but also admitting their common identity. I am Jekyll. In order to emphasize Ivy's dawning recognition of the truth, Fleming adds a significant moment when um, uh, Ingrid Berman says, for a moment I thought. So she almost recognizes Jekyll. The black mark. <laughs> how, how much time? Finish? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's all. I was, uh, I, was, I was going to talk about dreadful uh, pleasures and sexual fantasies, but you won't get that. How frustrating. Okay.